Welcome again. Uh, today is the 16th of November, in case uh, you get uh, stressed about it. Uh, as Ali has pointed out, that it's not the 17th. Uh, and so, let me just set this up, and then I'll, I'll introduce uh, the, um, our guest speaker. Um, so our first guest speaker is uh, Sally Augustine, uh, Principal at Design with Science. Um, Sally is a practicing environmental design psychologist and Principal at Design with Science. Um, she is a fellow of the American Psychological Association um, and uh, author of uh, a number of books including uh, Place Advantage, Applied Psychology for Interior Architecture, um, and has uh, done a number of uh, projects and has a number of connections in North America, Europe, and Asia. So I'll let Sally say some more about herself. Sure. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Well, I think I will lead off by introducing myself. Um, I'm an applied environmental psychologist, and um, that means I think about things like... Um, how the colors on the walls, the ceiling height, the textures under people's feet, etc., all that physical stuff, how that influences how people think and behave. Um, and um, I work with people around the world, make recommendations um, with, uh, to individuals who are, or groups that are designing uh, places or objects or services. Our plan for the day is I'm going to talk about um, uh, well-being and, and wellness, um, review some re uh, related research with you relatively quickly. Then I'm going to um, present a little model that integrates um, uh, the material that I will have um, discussed with you. And um, then we'll talk um, a little bit about um, uh, how these uh, sorts of um, pieces of research get uh, used, in, you know, in actually in the real world. Um, there are a couple different issues that I wanted to review up front before we uh, really um, get into the um, body of the talk. First, I'm going to be talking about mood a lot. Um, I, um, I'm going to be talking about what sort of mood um, different sorts of experiences um, put people into. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, when you're in a more positive mood, we'll just be upbeat now, think about putting people in a positive mood. Well, when people are in a positive mood, um, they're better at problem solving, um, they're, they think more creatively, they get along better with others, and if they're raised in the West, their immune systems function more effectively. That's why mood will be coming up over and over again. Um, another important related concept is well-being. Um, you know, well-being and wellness are very um, closely related, and. Um, it's important uh, to keep in mind that um, although we'd like to think that um, all these uh, factors can um, always be rigorously measured objectively, both well-being and wellness do have a subjective component. So um, these are um, the major um, areas of the, of the research I'll be um, moving through uh, relatively quickly to give you an idea of the kind of work that's been done uh, uh, related to how the physical environment um, can enhance um, uh, wellness and well-being. We'll talk about um, reducing stress and th thereby improving mood, um, encouraging healthy eating, supporting sleep by a design, uh, building activity into um, spaces, and um, we'll talk about some other factors as well. And so first, we'll talk about reducing stress and improving mood through design. And remember a moment ago, I talked to you about why I think mood is so important. So I want to make the point right off the bat that one of the uh, most effective ways <coughs> that designers can um, uh, diffuse stress among people that are using a space is to give people in that space some uh, a reasonable amount of control over um, their physical experiences there. That, um, Get, get stress levels uh, down, um, and we care about stress because um, when people are stressed, um, their mental and physical health is degraded. So if you give people a reasonable level of control, let them modify two, three, four things in their world, um, th their stress levels are, are, are reduced. So that's the single best thing you can do to keep stress down in an environment. And related to that is um, creating an environment that communicates to the people who are working there or who are using it 
that they are valued by their organization. This nonverbal communication is key, and when people are reading messages in the spaces around them that are inconsistent with how they want to be viewed, et cetera, stresses them all out. Like you think you're doing a good job, um, your organization values you, then they put your workspace down in the basement, like near near the HVAC system. You know, like that kind of disconnect really stresses people out. So you have to avoid that kind of thing. Now, um, I want to talk briefly about um, some of the research that's been done about um, related to sensory experiences and how they can be used to um, to, to cut stress levels. So, um, you know, we've all uh, heard something about natural light and how natural light can boost our mood. And, it, and it's, it's really interesting when you get into the research and you, you find out why this happens. It actually turns out that um, sunlight um, alters the level of nitrous oxide in our skin and in our blood, thereby reducing blood pressure. So, you know, there's more to, you know, sitting in the sun than, you know, just getting a tan. Um, you know, also, um, you know, so, so, so that it cuts stress, you know, being in the sun. Um, also, um, being in daylight helps us keep our circadian rhythms in sync with the world around us. And um, doing so, you know, it, it is also very important for our stress levels. Researchers have found that um, having our circadian rhythms synced with our location puts us in a better mood um, and enhances our cognitive performance. But if you're trying to, you know, recreate um, uh, natural experiences inside to help people keep their um, circadian rhythms in sync with their place on the planet, you have to remember to alter both the intensity and the color of light. Again, that comes out of the research. And, um, you know, I, I'm reviewing some of the research to give you an idea of the flavor of what, what's out there. It's also important that spaces are naturally lit because when people are in a space that's naturally lit, they're less likely to be under-stimulated. And when we are under-stimulated, we are just as stressed as when we're over-stimulated. <coughs> With sunlight, often comes views of nature. And when we think about nature, we think about cognitive restoration. When people are exhausted mentally, because they've been doing a lot of focused work, for example, they get really stressed out, puts them in a terrible mood, their performance is degraded. Um, so, you know, you've probably heard about the fact that when people looking at uh, look at certain sorts of nature, sort of a northern deciduous forest type environment, um, that um, helps them restock their levels of mental energy. But as um, designers, you can do more than just provide that sort of uh, opportunity to people to um, restock their mental energy and beat this stress that comes from having done focused work. Um, uh, people can also um, be restored by looking at um, fish tanks, um, because fish tanks, as all these things that help people restock their mental energy, are effort what's known in the biz as effortlessly fascinating for us to look at. They intrigue us. We can't help but uh, uh, you know, pay attention to what's going on. And when we're paying attention to where the fish are swimming, our brains get a break, which is, which is good for us in terms of our stress. Um, water, looking at water, either naturally occurring water or water in a fountain, also, you know, like a fountain that shoots water in the air, whatever, a fountain, not a drinking fountain. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting <coughs> to come and, and, and speak in, um, in England because isn't, didn't somebody once say the Americans and the British are two great, two great people separated by a common language? You know, <laughs> every so often I realize I'm using a word that probably has a very different meaning here than, than what I intend. But anyway, um, so looking at um, naturally occurring uh, water or uh, some sort of man-made water feature is, um, is, is restorative, again, beats stress, puts people in a better mood, you know, helps them feel better mentally and physically. And even w researchers have now found that looking at certain sorts of urban environments is also um, cognitively restorative, but that would be a lecture in and of itself. If anybody's interested, they should contact me later and um, I can share the details of that. I also wanted to talk a little bit about other sensory experiences and what they can do for you stress-wise. This actually is a photo of um, a water feature 
that's inside uh, the Time Warner building in New York City, by the way. There's water you know, running down um, of this textured surface. Um, uh, again, uh, restored it. So I, I want to talk a little bit about noise. Um, in open offices, the higher noise levels really stress people out. And research has tried those higher um, noise levels and stress to de directly to degraded health. But there's a lot of things going on in an open office that create stress for people, things like privacy invasions and things like that. So there's many different factors of open offices that stress people out and degrade health, but um, uh, uh, sound is, is a primary one. I also, uh, I also wanted to talk about, again, to give you the flavor of the research, um, an indirect effect that noise can have on people's health. Um, researchers have found that in hospitals, sound levels are generally 15 to 20 decibels higher than are recommended by the World Health Organization. Okay, so that's bad for patients, but it's directly, but it's also uh, has a negative effect on the performance of the nursing staff and the other care staff. So, you know, the sound directly impacts the patients and again, indirectly it affects them through uh, degraded performance of the nursing staff. But, you know, there are always fixes, you know, and I've been talking about sound that's um, stressful, but um, there are, um, uh, sounds that are really great stress busters, if you will. And one of those um, sounds is um, nature sounds, sounds of water, uh, birds, again, that northern deciduous forest, those sorts of sounds, you know, wind moving gently through trees, not, you know, hurricane force winds. Um, and um, I was um, stunned recently. My uh, husband had to have some uh, minor outpatient surgery, and I walked into this a small outpatient surgery center in suburban Chicago, basically the middle of nowhere, and they were playing nature sounds. So um, it's out there. And again, um, I'm giving you a taste of the research um, that, that's out there in this field um, uh, because there's just each one of those four bullet points, um, you know, de designing to reduce stress, etc., could um, be an hours long talk in and of itself. So now we're gonna talk about, give you a flavor for some of the research that relates to encouraging um, healthy eating. Uh, you know, uh, there's been studies done that, you know, you might be able to just, you know, off the top of your head anticipate the results. Um, for example, when um, people um, can see where food has been prepared when they're eating or they see food that's been prepared that hasn't been served yet, they eat more. Okay, that's not very surprising. You know, it's getting to be more and more relevant in our world as more um, <coughs> restaurants, for example, um, are being built where people can see the, the cooking going on. So, so that openness would encourage people to eat more. And something that underlies my comments in um, throughout this section on healthy eating is it's almost always bad to be eating more you know, more calories, so. Um, so that doesn't surprise you. I'm sure that, you know, when people can see the food and where it's been prepared, they eat more. Probably also doesn't surprise you that um, researchers have shown that the distance between like um, free, um, like coffee and things like that and snacks influences um, whether people eat the snacks. In the, this was a big deal in the States. Um, there was research done at Google's New York City office um, that, that showed, you know, snacks closer to the coffee machine, you know, people eat more or whatever. Again, that's sort of common sense. But then we move beyond the common sense. It turns out people are more vulnerable to eating un, uh, unhealthy food when um, they're in a cluttered or disorganized environment. So think about the design repercussions of that. You know, lots of workplaces are um, cluttered and disorganized to say the least. You know, people's homes are, etc. So, um, you know, this is all an argument for, you know, cabinets with solid doors that people can't see through in terms, and it helps people help with people's diets. Uh, you know, there's some research that's really curious, like um, people tend to eat less food when it's served to them on a larger table. Very intriguing. It seems like the larger table sort of distorts our perception of the amount of food we're um, being served and we um, tend to eat more. Um, we um, eat less food when we can see, we eat less unhealthy food when we can see ourselves in a mirror. 
turns out when we can see it. And, and it's not for the reason you might think, you know, although generally we behave better when we can see ourselves in a mirror because like we're, I mean, we start thinking about like our role in society or whatever when we can see ourselves and so we move outside ourselves a little bit. It turns out when you can see yourself in a mirror, you perceive that um, unhealthy food just doesn't taste as good compared to when you can't see yourself. Uh, art influences how much people eat. Um, when people see figures that are very thin and elongated, like um, Giacometti um, sculptures, they um, tend to eat less. Um, light influences how much you eat in interesting ways. As it turns out, um, when we're eating in dimly lit restaurants, we eat more slowly and ultimately eat less. But if we're in a more brightly lit space, we're more apt to order um, healthy food. So the effect of light is really intriguing. And then <coughs> just because um, I'm sure a lot of you are on airplanes all the time, an interesting bit of research that came out of Cornell, as it turns out, um, the sound levels in airplanes are, are really loud and um, about 85 decibels on average. And when you're in a space that, 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 that is that loud, um, sweet food doesn't taste as sweet to you, but um, food that's um, unami, you know, that sort of savory taste, that tastes much better to you. So there's a whole lot of really interesting things um, happening here. And um, I'll just spend a minute going through some of the other research. Um, you know, when people eat lunch at their desk, they um, uh, tend to make less, choose less healthy options when they eat in a, um, in a, in a lunchroom type place. And also, um, when we see people snacking, it's very hard for us to resist snacking ourselves. So think about the implications of these things for workplace design if you want to make that common area visible to all. But if all can see a few people snacking, that's bad from a health perspective. And then, you know, as it turns out, won't surprise you to learn that when people are in a restaurant eating in a booth, they tend to make less uh, healthy uh, selections. But it probably wouldn't be obvious <coughs> to you up front that when people are seated at one of those high tables, you know, the higher tables, they um, eat more healthy foods such as salads and fish than if they're at a regular high table. And, um, uh, and just one final point about um, eating, as it turns out, at buffets, people eat less when they see all the food offerings at the beginning of their um, uh, time at the buffet, and then when they have an obstructed view of the buffet later. So the whole idea is you should put the plates in a buffet in a location where people have to walk by all the food to get the plates, and then create some sort of screen, like a plants or something, between the buffet and where um, uh, people will actually sit. So, you know, um, sleep is really important to us. I'm sure this isn't news to you. Um, when um, uh, we don't sleep well, um, all sorts of terrible things start to happen to us physically and me mentally. Um, uh, when we um, don't sleep as much as we should, we um, weigh more, we're more depressed, all sorts of cognitive bad things start to happen to us and we, you know, we literally become physically ill. And um, we actually sleep um, best in places that are very dark, like blackout curtain dark. Um, and um, in the United States now, there's this whole movement about street lights and how they need to be uh, regulated. And even the American Medical Association has weighed in and um, uh, is making public pronouncements about, you know, uh, street light intensity and things like that. All that those street lights do contribute to um, to our health through our how they affect our ability to sleep. Um, I, you know, and then there's been workplace specific research done that relates to sleep. Um, uh, people who work in spaces with more daylight, as it turns out, are less depressed and they sleep better than people who work in areas with less daylight. And people have measured cortisol and melatonin levels to figure this out. Um, also, people who sleep, people who work um, nearer to a window sleep 46 m more minutes on average per night than people who are farther from the window. Again, you know, when you think about the links between sleep and health, you know, that, that 
really matters and um, I'm really keen on things like uh, sleeping pods in, in workplaces you know you can um, you know the research is really clear what puts people to sleep there's a known temperature known textures known sense you know as it turns out smelling lavender really does um, help you sleep um, in just in case you're interested if you smell jasmine you, you um, sleep um, uh, more deeply but lavender helps you fall asleep to start with um, you know there's certain sounds we know are, are, are relaxing and that kind of thing and I think it's you know Im important to um, give people an opportunity to sleep at work um, in some cultures there's it's been acceptable to sleep at work for a long time as a matter of fact at one point and I think it continues to today um, in many Japanese offices the lights actually get turned down at a certain um, time in the day and people basically put their heads down on their desks and, 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 and snooze for a little while. So, um, you know, uh, providing uh, darkness for people to sleep at home and, and napping pods at work can make people feel healthier. And, you know, there's all sorts of research that relates to sleeping. There's even people who have researched the ideal design of a bedroom, like where beds should be in relation to doors and windows and all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of material that, um, that, that can be applied. Now, um, I wanted to talk um, briefly about um, building in activity. Um, <coughs> you know, obviously there are lots of benefits to um, creating um, workspaces where um, people are, um, are more active, you know, in terms of like waistlines and, and, and things like that, but there's, um, you know, a, a, a more, more to it than that. Um, and we can encourage people to be more active through design. You know, um, God, I guess it's like five, six years ago now, there was study after study about how to design stairwells. So people were more interested in using the, the, the stairwells. And, um, you know, the result, study results were, were not that stunningly surprising. As it turns out, um, when you make a stairwell um, welcoming, like, you know, it's not freezing cold in the stairwell. Um, when you make it interesting, for example, there's something to look at in the stairwell, like art, or just something that changes every so often. When the stairwell is daylit, all those things encourage people to use the stairwell. Also, you can locate stairs so that um, uh, uh, they're more prominent than elevators, for example, which encourages use. And uh, But some of the more interesting research that relates to encouraging um, stair use actually relates to elevators, which um, might be um, uh, something you wouldn't expect. As it uh, turns out, um, there are reliable patterns in how many sets of stairs people are willing to go up or down. And you can um, program elevators so they do not stop on every floor and use this research. So as it turns out, people will, without um, much complaining, walk up one flight of stairs or down two flights of stairs. So the implications of this are you could have an elevator stop on one floor, skip the next two floors, and stop on, on the floor after that. So that encourages people to um, use the stairs, be healthier, and saves you energy all at the same time. You know, other topics that have been researched a lot are things like um, walkability, like creating neighborhoods where people want to walk. Um, uh, you know, and there's, there's some of that research that you can use inside buildings. Uh, for example, um, we'd like to follow a path um, that curves a little ahead of us. You know, we're suckers for a curving path. You know, we'll follow it. As long as we're in a pleasant place when we start out, we will keep going. So you can encourage people to walk and exercise a little by having what's technically known in the biz as deflected vistas. Um, and I share these terms with you in case you want to Google them, whatever, to, to learn more. And um, you can also build functional, what's known as functional inconveniences into a space to encourage people to walk, like um, uh, create a long path to the lunchroom or whatever. Um, but I want to make the point that um, for whatever reason, there will often be people who just can't 
walk further or etc or you know or, or climb the stairs so you always have to be remembering them and making sure that they can gracefully get from one place to another even though you've built in these inconveniences by grace when you without embarrassment you know for example i have asthma so it's hard for me to climb stairs so you know no matter what the skip pattern is i'll probably want to take the elevator so you know if the elevator taking the elevator requires me to tunnel to the back of some building you know that's that's a real negative, you know, because I can't do anything about the asthma. Or think about um, somebody who has a broken leg. You know, say you, you know, created a really long path to a, to a lunchroom. It's nice if there's a, a back way that they can readily access to get to that um, to, to get to that lunchroom as, as well. Because you know, like all of us have challenges from from time to time, at least. Um, I can't give a talk about um, wellness and activity without talking a little bit about the, all the research that's been done recently about um, uh, things like sit-stand desks, um, treadmill desks, that kind of thing. As it turns out, the research most consistently shows that there's value in changing your posture, you know, going from sitting to standing, standing, sitting, whatever, just change. There's a lot of value in change. And um, when people are working while walking at their desks at a gentle pace, um, usually actually a pace a little slower than they would if they were you know, uh, traveling from one place, to, actually traveling from one place to another building. But anyway, if you're walking while you're working, um, your mood is generally better, um, your performance improves, your memory function improves, and um, uh, you're apt to think more creatively. So there's good things that have to do with gentle, slow walking while you're working. Um, in terms of sit-stand sit desks, some research shows that um, uh, using those um, desks will improve um, performance. But it's important to point out that um, the research in this field is, in terms of sit-stand desks, etc., is not so consistent. You know, some people actually find um, no positive results from having people um, uh, uh, you know, stand, etc., while they work. Um, but, you know, um, sometimes you have to go with the reality <coughs> of the situation. Out there in the real world, there's a lot of people now thinking that um, sit-stand sit desks are what they have to have. You know, there's discussions about things like, you know, if your employer cares about you, they get you a sit-stand desk. So you're starting to actually get to a sort of placebo effect thing, you know. Even though technically the research doesn't support the sit-stand sit desks, you know, um, to keep a workforce um, generally happy and feeling like they're valued by their organization or whatever, it's important to provide this. So remember I was talking at the beginning about signaling, providing people with sit-stand desks in this day and age signals to them that you know you, you value their health etc so um, you know I um, also wanted to talk just about a, a few other ways that um, you know you can as a designer uh, increase people's um, well-being again to give you an idea about the research that's out there you know increase their well-being and their wellness um, there's um, been a lot of research done by a group um, that's at um, Harvard and um, I think it's uh, Rensselaer, maybe University of Rochester, anyway, in New York, that's um, been done with ventilation rates. And I see a lot of heads nodding, so I'll just really quickly go through this. As it turns out, um, when you enhance ventilation, basically um, the goal being to get carbon dioxide out of an environment. You, um, that action, breathing that fresher air, has been um, linked to um, uh, uh, enhanced performance. Um, and um, uh, things like um, people can focus better. 
um, uh, you know, they're better at decision making, they're better at um, manipulating information to make decisions, etc. You know, and so that, you know, fresher air, which has a sort of, you know, health uh, connotation to it, um, also um, has real positive um, implications for um, how people um, uh, think and work. Um, I also wanted to talk about green leafy plants. And I make the point that I'm talking about green leafy plants because um, I once gave a talk and just talked about plants and um, then someone contacted me later and they weren't getting the results they expected. Um, it turned out they put in cactuses and they put in cactuses because cactuses are hardier than green leafy plants. But you know, again, I'm beating this point to death. You really want to use green leafy plants to um, in, enhance, uh, cut stress. Um, you know, green leafy plants have also been linked to um, enhanced creative thinking, etc. And um, I realized I, at the beginning I didn't say that when I'm talking about research, I'm talking about studies that come out of the peer-reviewed press. Um, you know, um, sometimes when I'm on a plane or something and I explain to people what I do, they say, oh, you do feng shui. And um, <laughs> actually, um, every so often I agree with the feng shui master, but, you know, feng shui comes out of, you know, a, a folk tradition, and the material I'm sharing with you has been established by um, Western science, and you can feel good about applying it in, um, in various um, contexts. Five minutes, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, we're almost done. Happily. I have to tell you, I got here on Monday, and jet lag hit me today, so I was Sorry. really worried <laughs> how, how slowly I would speak, but it looks like it's going to work out okay. Anyway, so we can see that um, uh, if we help people cut stress, um, help them sleep, um, we help them eat in a healthy way, we consider these other factors like green leafy plants, we can really increase um, their um, wellness and well-being. If you think about... Um, how to order all the different things I've told you, you generally find that places that optimize people's cognitive, physical, and emotional being um, have what I call the five C's. They communicate. Remember, I was talking about nonverbal communication, sending positive messages to people. You know, that's something that a place that enhances wellness and well-being does. It also supports, in terms of communication, it also supports people speaking with each other, you know, interacting with each other. We get, um, uh, you know, one of the worst punishments you can give a person is to make them be alone. It's actually um, viewed as cruel and unusual punishment now in a lot of the United States for solitary confinement. So, um, again, so um, we didn't talk about socializing, but that's an important part of creating a place for wellness. Um, uh, a place where people uh, are well, will be comfortable, will give them things like control. We talked about that, cognitive restoration, cut stress levels. Um, it also um, continues over time. We'd like a space that evolves slowly, not one that um, uh, changes really quickly. That's jarring to us, so gradual evolution increases our well-being. And again, we didn't have a chance to talk about all the points that support these in the time available. Challenge, a place, a good place helps people grow and develop as ways that they think are, think are meaningful. And by coordinate, I mean it helps them do whatever they plan to do in the space. And. Um, if we're thinking about all these different aspects of physical, mental, and social well-being, as it turns out, the ones that actually get research and all that gets applied most is really that things that relate to physical well-being, like ergonomics and glare, because those um, uh, factors are easier to, to measure. Um, and when we're thinking generally about inclu increasing um, people's um, wellness and well-being, that's really... Um, uh, a topic that um, people are most concerned about in terms of employees that are difficult to replace for one reason or another, at least in, in my experience. You know, people who seem easily replaceable to the organization, you know, they can work how they can work, you know. But people who are like a high-powered engineer, Google, whatever, Google pays attention to their um, wellness and well-being. And then, um, one of the things I think we'll be um, talking about a little bit um, or more thoroughly in um, the debate period is um, standards like you know, well or fit well and how they align with the research in my world. And um, um, you know, well and fit well 
generally pull from the same pool of research that's published out there, which is not, by the way, the entire collection of research in my world, but well and fit well tend to pull from the same research, so they tend to be pretty consistent with each other, et cetera. They just sort of have a different approach to their basic operation, different pricing models and things like that. But it is also true that I find in general that these systems don't replace a human being who's familiar with the different research because there's a lot to integrate, et cetera, in terms of creating an effective space. So I was going to conclude by saying that design that recognizes our humanness in all of the positive and negative ways that we are human and all the different emotional, cognitive, and physical implications of how our minds work and bodies work, well, that kind of design makes it more likely that we'll be happy, healthy, wealthy, well, at least emotionally wealthy and wise. And when you design, you have to remember that we are physical, social, and cultural creatures and design that keeps us genuinely and comprehensively fit recognizes and reflects all those different layers of our lives. So that's where I am. I'm happy to answer questions now or if you'd like to send me a question via email, happy to answer any questions you might send via email. And now I'm not sure what you want to do next. Thank you. Are there any questions for Sally? Don't be shy. Maybe I went so slowly I wasn't actually speaking. You know when you have those like out of body experiences? I can tell you a joke about myself while you come up with a question. Well, I have one or two questions. Okay, there we go. But let's go with one of the audience. So just, yes, Jason talks about these kind of visual, physical semantics that kind of play into the empty spaces. Right. No. No. It sounds super interesting. We're talking. Yeah, it, um, I'm just trying to put it together. I haven't seen a place recently um, that uh, reflects all of these different concerns. Um, you know, um, I, I, um, one of the things I did say because there's only so many minutes you know, the information we can share is um, uh, this. This research um, is often difficult to apply in one context or or another. So you have to think about the holistic experience you're creating for people. For example, um, fish tanks are very relaxing to look at, but in healthcare environments, you almost never get an opportunity to be in a, in a, fish, in a fish tank because the people in the um, hospital who are concerned about um, uh, germs and all, and who um, have a lot of say over how the hospitals are designed, are terrified of fish tanks. You know, all that bubbling water, who knows what's in that water, and who can be it. Who can be it. So you, know, you have to think about um, being practical. And you know, in in, in in the context of um, this is why I like to illustrate papers whenever I can with um, uh, of drawings as opposed to photographs because it's very difficult even if you're pouring through all of the eye stock photos or whatever to find one where everything goes has been done just right. But I can tell you about some spaces that I find uh, really effective. There's um, a Calatrava um, museum in Milwaukee. It's an art museum, and the goal is to put people into a really reflective state as they enter the museum. Um, this space has um, a curved ceiling, which would be very relaxing to people. We have a very positive response to the curves. We find them nurturing. No environment is ever entirely curved or entirely straight, but this curved ceiling is just to put people in the right mood. Also, um, the um, uh, the colors in the space are very relaxing blue because um, uh, they're actually reflected off the water in Lake Michigan, which is just outside this building. And you often see um, the same sort of ripples of light in the ceiling and walls uh, that you do in the lake. And that's significant to me because those sorts of patterns and movement um, 
are um, uh, fractals of a certain sort that people find uh, fairly relaxing. It puts people in this, so this like lobby in this the museum puts people in here just right so it contemplates. Sorry, they didn't catch the, the name. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know the actual technical name of this museum, but it's the in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. There is only one art museum. <laughs> it, is that, it is that art museum. It's like the Milwaukee Museum of Art or something like that. Yes. Um, it's a follow on question, Sally. Yes. So, so given that you, you've given us this great presentation and you've documented this in your books and so on. Sure. And given Not that, references. <laughs> <laughs> and given that you've just said you haven't seen it put into practice. Well, I haven't right. seen it entirely put into yeah. practice. Yeah, so my question is what, why aren't people putting it into practice? People put parts into, into practice, but, um, you know, Whenever you, it's pretty clear why they wouldn't necessarily do all of it when they're um, retrofitting a, a, a space. Often there's some sort of issue with like a ceiling height or something like that that they just couldn't can't be changed. Um, and um, with with new structures, um, you know, often I see things that are are, are, are pretty close, but um, you know, it's like um, there's often a lot of politics in, when a building is built, and so. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time working on a building where um, the architect actually, you know, I talk to the architect a lot, who being friendly and doing all sorts of great things. And then um, uh, the owner's brother-in-law, um, th this was a big corp corporation, but anyway, the owner's brother-in-law um, had some family thing, started to talk about how he knew a lot about architecture. And um, he, made suggestions that were accepted by the family that basically screwed up the whole design. The architect was so pissed that he wasn't even going to come to the ribbon cutting. Eventually, they um, convinced him somehow. Um, so you have factors like that that come into play. Like either the physical realities of the situation can make something difficult, or sometimes politics. This means drunk over here. Excuse me? This means drunk over here, not upset. Oh, sorry. I meant that. that. <laughs>
maybe take a seat sure. there for now because um, we now have our uh, panel, uh, some of whom have sent uh, some slides. So what we might do first is that each member of the panel will maybe come up and do their uh, four to five minutes pitch, even though some of the slides are very long, but we were told that it will be within minutes. And then we, the, the panel members will sit at the front and, the, and then you can fire questions at them. Uh -oh. um, not literally. <laughs> Okay, who would like to come first? Um, uh, um, Ed, would you like to come first? If I <laughs> is, is yours the black one? Black um, bag? That's, that's Nigel. Okay, Nigel first then, sorry. There is a clicker. Let me introduce you, please, Nigel. Um, <laughs> so, Director of Workplace United, uh, Unlimited and also Honorary Senior Lecturer at UCL and in fact your, your teaching and module well-being in buildings uh, for our MSc. Um, uh, Nigel is a workplace strategist, change manager, environmental psychologist, researcher, international speaker and published author with 11 years research and 19, year, 19 years consulting experience and I'll leave it there. Nigel. Thanks the show sets some very big questions at the start, which hopefully you've forgotten. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really tough ones to answer. And I'm, I'm actually, at the end of it, quite a simple guy. And I think something I like doing is taking lots of information and boiling it down into simple models that I can contain in my tiny brain and then disseminate out to other people. So I was thinking about this whole question of wellness, health, well-being, performance. I was thinking, how can, how can I boil this down into something that I can comprehend more easily? And I came back to Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and my students who are in the audience, you will recognize this because we talked about it already. But for those who don't, this, this uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs dates back to the 1940s. And what Maslow said is in order for us to reach our maximum performance, we have to meet these various <coughs> criteria, and they're in <coughs> order. So first of all, we have to satisfy our basic physiological needs. Uh, such as comfort, health and sleep, and then he goes on about it, safety, belonging. And it's only when we start to do things like, um, where we're, we're catered for in terms of our esteem and our, that our sense of self-actualization that we can perform to our maximum. So I, I like this model, which, which to be honest has never been proven mm -hmm. by any experiment, but it's, it's a lovely model and it works for me today. Um, but what Kate Lister did, and I'll put a reference there, is she said, oh, when you look at this in terms of the whole health, well-being, wellness, well-being debate, actually, a lot of this stuff down here is to do with wellness and health. And as you go up through Maslow's hierarchy, it tends to become to do more with well-being. So again, Sally's touched on some of these things today about the social belonging, about, about again, being, being rewarded and, and so on. So I like that model because it allows me to start putting uh, these bigger questions into a framework. And I'm just going to touch on some of some, some of the, the, the models, because one of, one of my beefs at the moment is that I, I do believe that quite often, as designers and architects of the industry, we focus on some of the glory stuff, some of the nice to haves, and we forget about the basics. And uh, this is a quote from uh, the Lisa Menini some, some time ago, but he found in, in his study of over 200, there are over 200,000 respondents, that only about half of them thought their workplace supported their productivity at work, which I think really poor and, and damning for our industry. And when I recut some of his data, if you look at in terms of on average what people were satisfied with and what they considered important, the things that they considered the most important but were the causes of dissatisfaction yeah. were actually some of Maslow's basic hygiene factors such as air quality, noise, temperature. And I do think that that lack of producing high performing buildings, productive buildings, is because sometimes we forget about these basic needs and we focus on the nice to haves. So another example, another piece of uh, research and stuff I'm really interested in the moment is this whole thing about how different personality types require different environments. And again, if you haven't read it, Susan Cain's book, The Power of uh, Introverts, uh, was a great book. Where she, her, main, her main issue was the fact that in America in particular, a lot of organizations now want extroverts or, or, or extrovert ideals. They're not even real extroverts, but they pretend to be extroverts. So they tend to be outspoken and use lots of gesticulation and, and, <laughs> and, and so on. And, uh, and, and re uh, employers want these people. And she said, what this is leading to is creating these environments that are designed for these extrovert, or, uh, extrovert ideals. So stimulating, buzzing, noisy, colorful environments 
And basically, we know that roughly, in terms of you know, exchange of the scale, but roughly half of us are introverts, half of us are extroverts. So she's saying we're forgetting about 50% of our population. And even worse, so I'll put it in a minute, um, my own research has shown that extroverts tend to be the people who spend more time out of the office, and when they're in the office, they're spending less time at their desk. So actually, we're designing these spaces for people who aren't even there. That's a bit ridiculous. Right, so as a psychologist, back to some basic psychology, how the introversion extroversion thing works is with arousal theory. So, uh, look it up if you don't know, but basically, we perform at our maximum, at our optimum level of arousal. Our arousal is like our base level of metabolism and, 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 and emotional excitement and so on. So that's a normal curve that you would expect. It's the inverted year, year starts so and it goes back years. And what happens with all the extroverts is they have a natural low level of arousal. So yeah. they are constantly seeking stimulation. They need stimulation to make sure that they perform at their maximum. Whereas the introvert, it's different. They already have a high level of arousal. So they need to be in calming environments. They need to, 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 to they, they, want, they want a little bit more calm and a bit more quiet in order for them to seek maximum arousal. And what happens is the, in, in a, a colorful stimulating environment, basically the introvert is overwhelmed, they get stressed out and their performance drops off. In a calming, quiet, subdued environment, the extrovert might find that they're feeling a little bit drowsy and fatigued and they're not interested and they're not off. So it's really difficult to design environments which cater for both these types of people, these groups of people, unless you offer true choice, which Sally touched on. And that's that. So experts spend less time in the office. And then the other final thing I, I, I want to touch on in terms of theory is evolutionary psychology. And again, my students, you will recognize this slide. <laughs> but we, we know as humans, uh, our physiology has evolved over millennia to allow us to survive, to survive on the African savanna and work on the African savanna. And what the evolutionary psychologists say is the same as happened with the brain. The brain has developed over millennia to help us to survive on the African savanna. But actually, we were then pushed into modern offices about 100 or so years ago. And the brain hasn't caught up. So our innate preferences are for a much more natural environment. But we're, being, we're basically putting people in boxes uh, in unnatural environments. And, and this can cause problems. So when we think about the office, we need to cater for some of these innate preferences, some of these natural preferences. And that's uh, things about, so think about daylight. Are we providing maximum daylight, enough daylight for people? Um, it's important to tell passing of time and so on. Are we providing views out and vistas? Parks back to when we were on the plains and we were hunting, we needed to see out and we didn't like people behind us. Temperature and air movement, Sally's touched on it already. We actually like fluctuations, we like slight variations. We don't just like single temperatures and we don't like massive uh, temperature and air movement fluctuations. Sounds, our preference for sounds are natural sounds, natural environments, water, again, Sally touched on it. But also at, at that level. So yeah. what we find in the office is that uh, we are exposing people to higher levels of sound than they might be uh, naturally prefer, let's say. Uh, we're inquisitive, we're social, we like to move around. That's where all the, the active design, all the, all the move, let people move around, don't let them be sedentary. It's not good for us physiologically or psychologically. We need to provide food and drink, we like sharing stories. Uh, but also, as well as being social animals, we also need time to contemplate, we need solace, we need time out, so we need to provide that as well. And uh, again, Sally touched on the whole issue around biophilia, which is basically this affinity to nature and providing green and pleasant pastures, uh, but bringing nature into, 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 the, into the workplace, uh, which enhances, and there's lots of studies which show that can enhance our performance as well. So to wrap up, I've basically quickly rushed through some of these ideas around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's what we saw earlier. And what I, what I think, I was trying to think of, so how do we design the best workplace? And I think I, there is a kind of hierarchy. Okay. And what I, I, so I've used Maslow, but I've kind of superimposed some design features. So I think, yeah, down at the bottom, it is all about providing good sanitation, good toilets. Uh, Neil Usher talks about the elemental workplace. Toilets are really important for us. And also toilets, how your toilet is, is representative of the rest of your building. It's a litmus test. Uh, provide the right nutrition, we've touched on that as well, and obviously shelter. And then we've got to have the kit, we've got to have the equipment and the facilities to be able to perform our job. We also need safety and security. We need safe environments, health and safety means that we need secure environments. We need to know that we can work uh, long hours if we need to, we can work and, and be safe. 
And then I think further up the hierarchy comes this whole issue of comfort, and I've included life earlier there. We've got to provide comfortable environments to allow people to move up, uh, move up and, and perform to their maximum. Uh, and then again, uh, Sally talked about we are social animals, we, need, we, need, we like to collaborate, we like to communicate, we need social uh, environments, we need to support that in the workplace. But I would like to add to that that we also need to allow for people to, to have quiet and privacy and, and, and so on. And ultimately, as you can see, it comes down to choice. I, I, I think the only way we can do this, the only way we can satisfy the needs of people in the workplace is to provide free... Uh, provide true choice of where they can work, when they can work, and how they can work. Right, so our next speaker will now be uh, Ed, whose slides will therefore be these ones. Uh, let me give you this, Ed, and let me find you on this value, sorry about this. Um, right, so Ed Garrod is principal at Elementa Consulting, uh, uh, joined Elementa Consulting, a leading deep green engineering practice as head of sustainability in 2014. Uh, he's a well-known advocate of health and well-being in buildings in the UK, speaking at industry ac and academic conferences and providing pro bono training to over a thousand built environment professionals. Um, over to you. Yes. yes, my reading is quite boring, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, so when we, it's, it's always good to have people go before you to sort of back up. It's like when you do a speech, a best man speech, or if everyone else has told your jokes, but this is, the, <laughs> this is the thing. If you think about when you were happiest, um, when you felt the most well, when you were really, really satisfied, it was probably when you were kind of this sort of age. And uh, why? It was because you had nothing to really worry about. You didn't have a job. You were outside, mm -hmm. it was wonderfully sunny, um, no cares in the world. Critically, you're outside. That's this thing about being in nature. When you think about where you choose to go on holiday, you choose to go to amazing places in nature, not generally to be inside buildings. And um, the reason I say this, we talk about this, this, this has a lot of um, debate at the moment about well-being or health or how these two things interact. And, and Marcella's sort of provocation in a way was about the WHO definition and everyone's kind of trying to say, well, mine's inside yours or yours is inside mine. But the way I tend to look at it at the moment and the work that I've been doing recently is around this aspect of physical health, and if they're in medical professions, it's kind of easy for them because it's easy to measure, um, which was to your point, at least you can have a focus on the stuff that you can measure. Also, the sample sizes that they work with are frankly enormous. You know, the evidence base around why asbestos is bad for you is thousands of people presenting with symptoms over decades that tell us this is bad for you. Whereas when we talk about uh, the relationship between uh, so the heart rate studies, you think the sample size, but they're kind of 50, 60 people. You know, when, when you present those to a doctor, they start laughing. This isn't science for them. But it doesn't mean it hasn't got value. It's just it's from a, it's, we actually don't have the research into this tough stuff, which is really around the well-being. We know from everything Sally and Nigel were saying, actually that's the stuff that, that we need to focus on as well. But if we're actually going to get there and talk about well-being, we, we need to listen to the people, because if well-being is something you self-report, it's harder to measure. It's something you're going to give people data from in a survey environment, generally. You'll tell people how you feel. You've got to listen to people. You've got to ask those questions um, to, to, to develop that evidence base. So one of the things that we're big advocates for is post-occupancy evaluation. So um, some of you will have come across the CPC, <coughs> Indoor Environmental Quality Comfort um, Assessment. There's several thousand buildings have gone through this process. It's a reference standard in well, in well for um, post-occupancy. And in VR, uh, we can look at that big sample size and say, well, if we look at all these buildings over here um, that are using all air systems versus those that use radiant cooling, um, not such a big sample size, it appears that they <coughs> are 20% happier um, in terms of measures of their, their thermal satisfaction in radiant buildings. And we don't know causation correlation, but the evidence seems to suggest that people quite like being in spaces that have a good balance of, of air temperature and radiant. But then you have opportunities in real buildings to test them side by side. This is a project that colleagues of mine had, <coughs> had in Oakland did several years ago. It's for emphasis in India. The client wouldn't buy the idea that radiant uh, spaces with radiant cooling could give this benefit. So they said, OK, you do one side of the building in VAB, so all air on one side, and the other side you can, you can do your crazy, wacky radiant system. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and, um, 
what you found is in the, the behavior, and this is a building engine with very, very low build costs, real challenges in terms of construction. So in your best practice behavior system in that, in that uh, context, 45% of people um, were satisfied with their brand new building. So this is how badly buildings were formed. Even brand new buildings are meant to be doing well. Uh, it's pretty poor. But in the radiant wing, there was 63% of people were happier. So in terms of satisfaction, it's a big delta there. So you've got a side-by-side -side comparison. So you're looking at the evidence, asking people the question, are you happy? Um, and the truth is people started moving from the all-air wing to the radiant because they had the choice. <coughs> so then you have problems on one side. You actually didn't have enough air because so many people are crammed in. It's so much more comfortable. Um, and so we face an industry that's also, it doesn't have a good evidence base. There's been huge steps uh, taken by one by, by others to try and bring this all together. It's really important. But we are faced with people who look, look at us in meetings going, what are you talking about? <coughs> when we ask them to document for their kind of certification processes, they think, oh no, this is, this is more of what I'm having to deal with day to day. And they just want simple direction and simple decisions. Um, so that slide's gone, but don't worry. And that's, <laughs> that's the life cycle for, um, for offices that uh, didn't appear on that PDF for some reason. But the point being is when you ask people how we create buildings, and you talked about politics and uh, sort of the stress of any project, it's partly because there's so many different stakeholders and they all have different needs and different agendas. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong, but they all need to talk to each other and, and find out, well, if I do this now, if I choose this site, a really polluted environment, but I have great transport, that's going to give me air quality problems in the future, but I won't be involved in that decision. So what have I given to the next person along this chain? And that's the reason that we're doing, currently working on the BCO study for Wellness Matters, which is trying to work out who needs to do what when um, to help people make better decisions. So this is just from one of the workshops that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've been um, bringing together lots of different stakeholders, whether they're clients, um, end users, interior designers, to try and map out who needs to make those decisions when. And it really backs, backs up that general thesis that actually none of us are talking to each other. So the biggest challenge to, sort of, to Marcello's question, what would you change? would be that we need courses like yours mm -hmm. that you're doing here to mm -hmm. talk about these gaps between understanding. Because actually the knowledge base is pretty pretty sound and you're, people are nodding their heads about the evidence base you hear. It, that evidence base isn't shifting hugely, but getting it out to each of these people know what they need to do to make it happen is the real challenge that we have to overcome. So that's what I would do. Great. Thank you very much endorsement of the idea of doing an MSc. Uh, <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, Vicky with uh, no slides, so you will see off the top of your head, please. Uh, so Vicky Lockhart is Director of Business Development Europe for the International Wellbuilding Institute. Uh, she was part of the core team developing the new health and wellbeing consultancy service at the global consulting engineer firm Arrow. And then in 2017, um, joined the International Wellbuilding Institute team uh, over to you. And that's not your slide, but yeah. I'll leave that in the background if it's okay. It's my passing message, which I think is great. So <laughs> up there. Uh, lovely to see you all this evening, and I'm sorry there's no visual slide, so I'm going to try and keep this kind of thing brief. Um, so the question posed to us was, what are our current practices doing enough? And I think the emergence of this much debate, the creation of this dedicated course, the fact we've got all of these different specialists coming in from different disciplines, all to focus on this area, kind of gives you this answer already. There's definitely a gap in the market in terms of what we are delivering as buildings and how we as people are interacting with our environment. Everyone's understanding is starting to move on, but there's a, a great way to go, as Betty was saying. There's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of evidence out there, um, and people need some help in navigating that. So if you think about how we've all kind of approached this topic and come to you with a, a kind of thought, we've all begun with terminology started to try and define these terms. What do we actually mean by health and well-being and how are we trying to break down this, this topic? Which is how we as humans and people learning things break down really complicated issues. We need to understand constituent parts and it also reflects the evidence base. A lot of this research is trying to look at very specific variables with specific sets of people at points in time and it's now being aggregated together. Actually, we're kind of at the cusp, the beginning of a new wave of research that needs to happen, trying to bring all of these variables together and understand more of the interdependencies between them and how that starts impacting the outcomes. So thermal comfort and light and acoustics and space and <coughs> people's mood and how they're being <coughs> the employees, all of that as one scenario and how can you optimize different elements? What's more important to people? Is it the light? It often depends on their kind of acute community 
experience, if you put someone in a terrible acoustic environment, acoustics will be their number one concern. Take them out of that environment somewhere else and their priorities are changing. So there's not this kind of idealized, one time <coughs> people here in a beautiful, healthy space and we will be better in this environment. It is more complicated. We are messy variables of people coming in here, engineering and design, which like very standardized, simplified methods for doing things. We want our calculation code and our simulation protocol so that we get the right answer out, we deliver it, our job is done, and we don't end up in this space and we get that right answer. Life is a bit more complicated than that. So the general kind of remit of IWBI, why we were brought into existence and why we put forward the well-building standard as a tool to try and help industry is to try and help people navigate this world, give some kind of common framework for people to do the basing, to make sure it's holistic, we're thinking really broadly around building design elements like the air, like the light, like the comfort permissions, um, and also more of the lifestyle and habits that it's fostering, so more of what Sally and Nigel can touch on, and the psychological impacts of the design. How is it impacting dietary habits? How is it impacting how people are moving? Why is this important? There's lots of examples where we've made decisions about different parameters with a kind of limited subset on. So energy policy is a really good example. We think about environmental sustainability, carbon energy prices. We had a big policy push to get commercial fleet over to diesel engines. The diesel engines are fantastic when it comes to efficiency. You can go further with less polluting or attention. Brilliant idea, except now we've got the legacy So this was an energy and kind of climate change driven policy that forgot to consider the unintended consequences on human health. We need to think of these two in tandem, super, super important. Lots of this has been very human centric, which obviously I think is great and we all think is really, really important, but this is actually a broader story of planetary health. We need to always make sure we're thinking about the bigger ecosystem, the bigger biological network that supports other individuals and life um, final kind of rounding off message when we we'll pose the question, what in particular is overlooked? Why does it matter? So I think if we think about the kind of perceptions, the feedback we're getting from people, and if you also just look at the media, what common society is concerned about at the moment? You can see this concern rising in people. People are worried about looking at blue screens late at night. They're worried about taking their children to work, to school, along kind of busy roads with particulates. They have a lot of concerns about the role the environment is playing on them and want to understand how to make better decisions. Our challenge as the industry is trying to de-jargonize and make that information really accessible to people. So it's not about terrifying. Look, you're being poisoned in your buildings. You've got terrible toxic chemicals in the water that you're going to be high from and all this kind of alarmist reaction. It's about very proactive steps. This is within your control. Your health is kind of your responsibility and something you can take ownership of. And we can help as the industry in ensuring that you are not being put in threatening positions that might um, damage or justify your health moving forward. We're never gonna get there. There's never gonna be this kind of thing. <coughs> this is no longer a concern.
in the meantime, I'll put the question that was posed to the panel, uh, if I can put this up in the back. Um, but so, so I think we'll take any questions, uh, but then hopefully we can also go um, into that. And uh, the PowerPoint slide is slow. Doesn't like me tonight very much. Okay, so. Um, God. No idea. That's it. A minor tone. Yes, that's it. So, that was the original question that uh, we asked the, the panelists. Um, uh, but of course, you know, we can go broader. So, anyone would like to um, open up <coughs> the conversations on this or on anything else relevant to tonight? <laughs> Anything else relevant to tonight? If anyone wants to ask what you did for dinner last night, ask later, please. Anyone? Here we go. In, in the workplace, what have been, what have been the barriers that perhaps the company has kind of introduced to this or the new design thought to optimise the employee experience? Is it money or...? For anyone would like to take that? So, shall we...? out there and that's how it's shown and so on. Um, for some reason there just seems a reluctance to accept some of that data and I see a, a, a financial uh, a manager, a director or um, maybe a developer who's interested in the return on investment. They seem to focus more on hard measures like space and cost than they do on enhancing performance and well-being. Um, and I, but for me that that's the biggest barrier. How do we how do we prove these things? And, and, and sadly, I think we can prove it, but even then, they don't believe it. Right. I, I think that Nigel's exactly right. Um, my one of my majors undergrad was finance, so you know I therefore feel free to criticize all people in finance. Um, but um, it seems that as a group, finance people must have had terrible experiences with <coughs> psychologists somewhere <laughs> along the line because um, Damage goods. yeah <laughs> who knows why but um, you know um, you know and also I think uh, they don't really understand like the the scientific method if you will like what I'm talking about when Nigel, you know when Nigel's talking about you know like research that's been done and you know conclusions that have been reached you know we're not just talking about like somebody sitting around chatting, thinking, whatever, you know, that there's a rigorous protocol, to, you know, to, to move through the system to, you know, you know we uh, feel comfortable talking about some sort of, you know, relationship, etc. But, you know, a lot of people haven't, don't have any scientific training, you know, and um, so, you know, uh, they don't understand the rigor behind what we say, you know, we can only you know, educate so many people about, you know, how scientists reach conclusions, whatever, at a time. And, you know, a lo lot of um, financiers want really hard data, but they don't know enough about the scientific method to understand that they've already got it. You know. So, um, it's a basic problem of split incentives. The people that benefit from better health and well-being aren't normally the people that are paying for it. So if a budget has been set for a building, it's a capital expenditure, and the benefits we're talking about are operational. They're human capital, they're social capital, they're not financial capital mm -hmm. at that stage. And so the, the problem is that we, we know that the, that basically you'll hear a lot is one to 100. One is your um, energy cost, 10 to 100 is your, your people cost. But when it comes down to it, we're only thinking about one in 10 when we do buildings. So that's the stuff that we're optimizing for currently. Mm -hmm. And until you get an HR director as, as your client, construction project and they say, ah oh, right, you give me the one percent of premium and productivity that's paid for the entire project, thank you, then you're not going to get the change that we need. Um, but that's always been the same true of energy until recently. The thing that's changed is the regulation steps in and says, you guys aren't optimizing our energy and it matters for climate change, so we'll regulate. So what we will need is uh, government and industry to 
put in place some backstops, I mean, that, that has to be considered in some way, then at least start to find some agreement. I think just in terms of kind of early projects that are really trying to be on the cusp of this movement, it's definitely been mixed successes depending on where in the organisation this initiative is coming from. Mm -hmm. So to Ed's point, this is being driven through from the HR department that have really been working very closely with the estates team and they're all excited and united around this common vision. It's been fantastic and they've really reached their full potential. If you've got one person who's a really passionate advocate, but they're slightly the wrong place in the hierarchy, or they're in a rather siloed department that the rest of the company kind of puts to one side, then that person can very quickly become rather like frustrated and disillusioned with the process because they they're there, they passionately believe this is the right thing to do, but it's very hard to convince that as a kind of internal campaign. So, so our education focus as much as the agents, the yeah. financiers, because yeah. um, they're the ones that will deliver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but also the, also the operators. Yeah. Um, I, I used to work for a, a facilities management company, and the key account managers, their, their incentive was to save money on the accounts to reduce mm -hmm. costs, mm -hmm. and their bonus was dependent on it. Okay. So, and they didn't, to be honest, being frank, and don't put this on Twitter, they give a toss about whether it affected people's <laughs> well being and performance. <laughs> So I think you've got that 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 problem as well. Is that the the, the you know the, the key players in our industry need to uh, focus on the end game, and the end game is always the people, not the builder. Anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Anyone who wants to build on that or introduce a new theme? Um, yes. I mean, just it's not really a question. It's just due to continue melting the, the ball. Um, so it seems that what we need to do now is is to find new ways to quantify the economic benefit of these these positive externalities, right? We tend to see things as as cost, but it's it's hard to really good quantify it because like as we touched on, right, the nerve is still hard cash. So um, yeah, there's research showing. Some, some links, there's productivity evaluations um, that you can then have links to this research and it goes to have your opinion on it and what to do, like what steps for it. Um, I think Raoul's helping with that. I mean, we've, we've got Clangog in the audience and uh, there was the case study where it started to show the ROI in terms of real benefits to the people compared to just saving a bit of space in energy. Right. So, and, and that's what we need more of uh, because I think people do listen to that. Stuff that we're doing in projects um, 
where the price ends up being you know, we don't want to pass it. And it is But it is possible to do this. Um, going back to what my undergraduate majors were, I was not only a finance major, but I was one class short of being an accounting major. I couldn't stand <laughs> the history of accounting. But um, you know, since you know, but there, I find that there aren't that many people um, in the world of people who know about this research who have any sort of like a, accounting background who could understand how to link things together in in, um, in a model. That's, um, that's compelling to people, you know, but the, the, the research does exist and, you know, people are tying it together in effective ways in terms of convincing people that it's possible. But is it also to um, the risk of no return on investment and, 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 and the, the length of time? Because again, mm -hmm. in, in the real estate and nuts and bolts, you see immediate return on investment. Right. That's what a developer wants. Whereas the stuff we're talking about, it could be three, four, five right. years before we Real right, but, but the, in the models you can think about that by uh, calculating like a net present value. Like in yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. so um, you know, it is it is possible. It's just um, a, a, a challenge because of you know people's you know off, um, general areas of expertise and you know background and things like that. But um, it can be hopeful. <laughs> I mean, so to that point, we we, we have done that. in the ways that they yeah, value, sure they you know, and a finance Absolutely. person, in, in, you know, values numerical solutions, you must present a numerical mm -hmm. solution. You, know, you have to I think about your audience. I think the other thing I've seen happen recently, but I think because we're, we're so desperate to show that there, are, there is benefit, I've seen some of the case studies where they've done something like a cognitive performance task and they said, oh, and we found a 20% decrease, and that is equivalent to a saving 20 million pounds a year. And it's like, no, no, please don't do that. Yeah. Because <laughs> that no one will yeah, no believe that. People, so people sometimes are not we stupid. shoot ourselves yeah. in the foot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people are not stupid. <laughs> yeah. You see a lot of people doing cumulative benefits. They go, well, we know the evidence is 2% better from daylight, 5% from this. Da, 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 da. And you go, oh, but somehow we've got like a 60% increase. <laughs> and I was at um, Harold Gothi, where I spoke to him the last one of the events here. He said to me, think about this in terms of um, you said bulk. He would never, ever, can never, ever.
So there's a, I think there's a, the range for the breadth between 5 and 8% is right. the maximum total improvement that we get from the very best of a sort of yeah. individual. Um, but that's a big prize. Yeah, it matters. Thanks for the talks, they were excellent. Um, so in IED, in our research group, we do a lot of work on um, quantifying the unintended consequences of carbon emission strat uh, reduction strategies. And I think that's relevant to your point. I really like how you framed that we should um, be looking to improve both uh, human and planetary health. And I think it's a really nice way to see it. And going back to your point about energy consumption versus productivity, um, Gains. Um, I, I just find it quite difficult, both with um, stakeholders or policy makers, or even when you talk to our students, um, about how we bring these two agendas together. And because quite often I think um, the unintended consequences of energy reduction strategies are viewed as something opposite to well being targets, whereas I think we should be looking at good design and I'm trying to identify the win-win design yeah. strategies. I just, I would like to hear your thoughts about how we move forward with this. I mean, would something like a, you know, merging well with lead of 3M standard be needed? Uh, in terms of regulation, what would be needed? Is it in interdisciplinary collaboration? The answer I got no. Yeah. So, um, I think in terms of our advice action project in mm -hmm. industry, we always say you should have a really holistic approach to yeah. sustainability. So couple an environmental framework with well if you're going for that don't yeah. do an either or and a yeah. kind of trade-off scenario because that could bring to view and what reduce benefits yeah. um, in terms of how to kind of convey that message the lancet has made some really interesting work yes. around this and i kind of plan to help me with it yeah. lots of kind foundation as well are putting a lot of work into this yeah. to try and convey the bigger public health movements and how that relates to bigger climate but is, is there a perception perhaps that at some point people are starting to say, if I've only got so, mu so much money, uh, and I, do I have to make a choice between investing it into you know, my, let's say, workplace um, well-being agenda as Absolutely. opposed to the energy efficiency? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there, there is a danger to, to kind of going into that trap, is there, would you say? I mean, we are all always going to be working in a resource-constrained world. There is no such thing as the bottomless pit of money <laughs> To, for a, a problem to be optimized. Um, so I think it's, it's nice when you bring all the topics on the table early on because you can find those solutions that meet both intentions, yeah. which are lower cost or which are zero cost or which are just actually a decision at the end of the day, which is completely neutral. Mm -hmm. Or it may throw up that there are scenarios where there's a trade-off. So yeah. ventilation rates, yeah. and energy consumption, a really classic one. And if you're in a scenario where you can't find the ultimate low energy, high IAQ solution, that's a debate worth having. Mm -hmm. And it has to be weighed up with the kind of data and the rationale that Ed was outlining, thinking about what's the actual function of this building. Mm -hmm. It's no good having the most energy efficient building if people can't perform their tasks there or don't want to be in the space. I'm just about to say that. If you, if, if, if it's always a ratio. Yeah. It's all, if, if there's always a balance. Space, energy, cost, um, or am I maximizing my performance? And it's always a seesaw, yeah. and uh, there's no point just saving CO2. So, uh, yeah, energy conservation uh, was an interesting point when I worked at BRE all those years ago. We first started by talking about energy, energy conservation. Yeah. Well, if I want to conserve energy, I just turn all the lighting and heating off. That, <laughs> that, is, hang on, that, that is not the right approach. So, it's always this value ratio, if you like. So, how do I get maximum performance? minimum CO2 usage, minimum cost. So it's always an, an efficiency ratio I think we need to focus on. And quite often we just look at one side of the seesaw rather than both. I think there's, um, there's an interesting parallel as we talk about feeding cars, the same for combined heat and power in, in London. We do all these things with the best intent. There are not, it's really easy with hindsight to look back at myself 10 years ago, I spoke to the CO2 system in low London go, you absolute muffin. <laughs> And we had the same thing when um, I was at Green Book a couple of years ago and Joe Allen's work around carbon credit was presented. Yeah. And a guy went up to my phone and said, and he just had tears in his eyes, and he goes, I've been minimising air, no, fresh air rates to save energy for the whole of my career. And I just, I don't know whether I can go out and talk to my children after this. 
questions? How are we doing for time? Um, one thing that I wanted to mention just to also close was to go back to the point that you made about the importance of the uh, of the chain in, in, in a building. That When we first launched uh, this, the MSC or thought about launching it, we, we did think whether we should try to um, cater and attract the whole of the chain and not, yeah. for example, only designers, but let's say, you know, facility managers, sure. planners, public policy, etc. And then we thought, actually, the nature of the industry at the moment is so fragmented yeah. that it's going to be quite difficult to A, attract, and B, kind of talk to all of them and right. make perhaps a believable argument. So, uh, but um, this might be one of the end goals that eventually mm -hmm. we, we develop something that does cater for all of us. The point is, you know, uh, you know what is um, the thing that makes them all then interested because, as you say, they've all got different. Now, if, if the policy was extremely st strong and the regulation and everyone has to sing to the same hymn sheet, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly everyone wants to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully that won't be the case because we'll, we'll never get there otherwise. <laughs> so any, any thoughts on the, on, the, on the stakeholders' alignment in any way other than, you know, we talked about the financial incentives and we talked about regulations. Um, so I'm mean, looking with the, the workshops we're doing for BCO at the moment, uh, we, we ask people what matters to them. So okay. we do that kind of hierarchy thing of saying which of these, you know, the matter thing, which ones do you think really matters? What's fascinating is they all assume that the the, the, the base wellness stuff, the health safety you know, experience, that's done by code. Yeah. And then you go, well, you know, it's not good that building over there, whatever, you can't imagine with it here. Yeah. But they think that actually it's really interesting is, is around the, the human experience. But what's fascinating is when people are asked them to think about one issue in detail, they'll pick up something like cleaning, and you'll get like a property developer and an FM manager and an architect and interior designer. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, this is easy. Why are we bothering doing this? And they talk to each other. They go, oh, crap. My decision is about this. Right, that's right. Can we get a cleaning room? Which means you can then keep that toilet right. clean. That means these people are getting sick. We hadn't thought of it that way. So what I would suggest is that as much as it would be great to invite the whole industry to be part of your course, it's more interesting for me what your this cohort goes into those sectors. They don't need to all go into design. And I trained as an architect and I did engineering. Does it, you'll all end up in different places. So um, hopefully one of you will become an agent, one of you will become a developer, one of you will, because you, those One of you will become the prime minister and change the regulation. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll end up, you will end up, the nice thing about architecture, because it's so fragmented, yeah. mm -hmm. is that you will scatter and it's, it's kind of viral in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that before we close? No, no, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's having multi integrated multidisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. So don't just think of it as a piece of front end strategy or design. Think of it the whole the whole way through this life cycle of the building and who are the people who, who are the people going to deliver it, who are the people going to manage it, and who are the people, and, 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 and and people going to manage the people as well. Yeah. And, and this is with, with your cleaning example, like you can think about like materials in terms of cleaning, whatever. Yeah. But also think about like the the human perspective, like if something can't be cleaned effectively, and it, you know it, it will send this message. It could easily stress people out. So you know, the chain you can't ever forget who you use it, no matter which chain you're working with. Great. Thank you very much. I like to thank you.